Good afternoon. It is good to be with everybody today. Thank you for being here. This edition of Frontline Fundamentals, we're in a series called From My Bookshelf to Yours. And what we're doing is just going through some very popular books and thinking about the lessons that we can learn from those books. My name's David McPeak, uh, author of Frontline Leadership, The Hurdles. In this series, we have talked about the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People from Stephen Covey. Great book. All these are great books. Extreme Ownership, really good read. Uh, Jocko Willick and, and Leif Babin. Jack Canfield's The Success Principles. And today we're going to talk about It's Your Ship, a really fantastic book if you haven't read it, from Captain B. Michael Abershaw. And in thinking about that book, and the lessons that we can learn from it, one word comes to mind, and that word is understanding. And if you've read the book, if you're going to read it, and or if you don't read it, I hope you can glean some good information from our discussion today. And it's kind of interesting. I was working on something last week, and it was a, a big, long Word document. And at the end of it, I was making an index. And it wasn't intentional on my part, but as I was making the index, I noticed the three most commonly used words in all that text were leadership, understanding, people. And I think that's such a great sentence. And if Captain Abershaw were with us today, I think that he would be happy if, if, if we made that statement as sort of the main lesson that you could learn from his book, Leadership, Understanding, People. And when I first read the book, I just got really excited. And I've read it two or three times now and made all sorts of notes in it and whatnot. But every chapter basically starts with some kind of problem or some situation that he was in. And he presents that in the first few sentences. And then the, the next sentence almost always says, I needed to understand. I needed to understand certain things. And in that is understanding yourself first and then others. Understand what others expect from you as a leader. Understanding the situation you're in, understanding the impact of your decisions, and also along with decisions, and I think this is a really important lesson, understanding the more control you give up, the more command that you get. As we like to phrase it, think about the two sources of leadership, personal influence, positional authority. Some, a lot of times, the more authority that you're willing to give up, the more influence that you're going to gain. So let's think about each one of these things and how we can seek to understand Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, that's one of the habits. But seek to understand. Seek to understand yourself first, and then others. And he proposes in the book that most obstacles that limit people's potentials, and when we say people's potentials, think about yourself as a leader and yourself as a safety leader, and even to a certain extent, your team, are set in motion by the leader and are rooted in his or her own fears, ego needs, and unproductive habits. Let's think about fear for a second. Going back to Jack Canfield's book, and when he talked about fear, he phrased fear, F-E-A-R, as fantasized experiences appearing real. And especially in terms of how we lead safety and, and leadership in general to a certain extent, how much do our fears hold us back? Because fear ultimately is the opposite in a lot of ways of courage. And courage, in terms of safety leadership, is taking action. It's when we see an unsafe actor condition, correcting. It's if we're performing a task and we're unsure about either our qualifications for the task or what the next step is or, or whether we've accurately identified and mitigated the hazards that we speak up. And those sort of things take courage and fear can lead to inaction. So really think about how we limit ourselves in terms of Fear, ego needs, unproductive habits. And then he goes on to say in his book, when leaders understand themselves, a transformation takes place that shifts perspective and helps them be perceived as more authentic. 
And what a great leadership lesson there, because if you think back through your personal and professional journeys, and you think about folks that were really good leaders, you probably perceive them as very authentic, and they had a lot of credibility, you could trust them. And the folks that you perceive to be not so great leaders, or bad leaders, however you want to phrase that, you probably, in some way, perceive them to be uncredible, untrustworthy. In other words, they weren't authentic. And you didn't feel like they had your back and were protecting you, which when we think about understanding what your team needs from you. But maybe, I'll probably say this four or five times, and, and I apologize when I say my favorite line from the book, because as I read through this book, almost every time I read it, I gain a new favorite line. So uh, we'll say one of my favorite lines of the book is this, and what a great lesson for us. The key to being a successful skipper is to see your ship from the eyes of the crew. The key to, in our world, the key to being a successful crew leader, foreperson, manager, supervisor, VP, safety consultant, safety coordinator, whatever your title is, the key to being a successful, your title, is to see your team the jobs that you're doing from the eyes of your crew, not just from your own eyes. And another one of my favorite lines, right? Constantly ask everyone for ideas because when you're asking everyone for ideas, what you're saying, I care about you. You matter. I value you. You are an intelligent, valuable member of this team. I want your feedback and your input. And it's one thing to ask for feedback. What a great term this is. Constantly ask everyone for ideas about how to do their jobs better. And then when you ask questions, when you're having conversations with people, I've always heard the term active listening. And there's nothing wrong with active listening for sure. But how about this term? Listen aggressively. And however you want to define aggressively, just, just take a moment and picture Maybe it's a football player. Maybe it is, uh, usually when we think of aggression, we, we kind of think of it in, the, in a negative connotation, but in a, in a non-negative way, think about what aggression looks like and then apply that to listening. If I'm listening to you aggressively, we're making eye contact. I am not fiddling around on my phone or behind a computer screen. My body language doesn't tell you I don't care about what you're saying. I'd rather be somewhere else. I am aggressively listening to what you're saying. And part of aggressive listening is, I'm careful to say, when folks give us feedback, new ideas, offer solutions, those sort of things, listening and hearing, and it doesn't apply that we implement every single thing everybody tells us. That would be impossible to do. But what it does imply is as we listen to people and as they give us valuable ideas, that we do turn those ideas into action. Uh, a quote I, I like to use a lot is, I think it's from Andy Stanley, but leaders who don't listen will eventually be surrounded by people with nothing to say. So I think if you from our discussion today don't remember anything else we're talking we're, that we talk about, Remember two things. First, see the ship from the eyes of your crew. And second, talk to your crew constantly, to your team, T, team, T-E-A-M. Together, everyone accomplishes more. And as you're talking to them, listen aggressively. And then a huge concept in today's world, change. And I've always sort of jokingly said, because most larger organizations have a department called change management. And there's nothing at all wrong with managing change. But understand when we use the word managing, at least in my mind, managing is things, it's deadlines, it's budgets, it's tasks, it's, it's those kind of things. And then when we talk about leadership, we're talking about people. So rather than just managing change, I think it's important that we lead change. And I think that there's some very, very valuable insight into how to lead change. 
in this statement, the secret to lasting change is to implement processes that people will enjoy carrying out. Now, let's go back to what we just said earlier. I'm sure folks will enjoy carrying out their ideas that you have implemented a whole lot more than they will enjoy carrying out the changes that you force upon them. That's not to say that part of your, that you should never force change on people. If you're in any kind of a leadership or a safety role, that's going to happen. That's part of what you need and, and have to and should do. But the secret to lasting change is to implement processes that people will enjoy carrying out and encourage people not only to find better ways to do their jobs. Always remember, the folks doing the work know how to do it the best. They know what works. They know what doesn't work. They probably have a heck of a lot of good and probably some bad ideas about ways to do that job differently listen aggressively to them. And this is such a crazy concept. It is such a good concept. And it is something that we miss so much, especially in terms of how we lead safety. We make safety unintentionally, but we turn it into like the worst possible thing. And what I mean by that, when we talk about safety, we almost always talk about incident rates, and incidents and how bad somebody's been hurt or how bad somebody could be hurt from this past. And when we present things, we present it in a way, I, you know, you know, I don't like this any better than you do, but we're going to have to do it. In other words, we tend to vilify safety. And if, this is a fun exercise. So go and ask your team, frontline workers, define safety. And, and maybe a better question to ask them is, hey, when I say safety, what pops in your mind immediately? And don't give them time to respond, make them respond immediately. And usually those answers are gonna gravitate a lot towards, you know, it's a lot of uncomfortable PPE. It's a lot of overly burdensome rules that I have to follow. It's a whole lot of have to and not a whole lot of want to. And to me, that's a problem. Captain Abershoff gives us a solution here at the end of this statement, but also to have fun as they did then. And that is certainly something that I would challenge each of you with. How can you make safety fun? How can we not just always send safety alerts that are, here's this really bad thing that happened and here's what we're gonna have to do because of it. How can we make safety fun? We do that. I'll read the statement again. The secret to lasting change is to implement processes that people will enjoy carrying out and encourage people not only to find ways to do their job, better ways to do their jobs, but also to have fun as they did them. So maybe as we're listening aggressively to ideas people have about how they can do their jobs better, I would propose another question we should ask is, how can you do your job safely? What can you do as an individual what can you do as a team and what can we do as an organization to make your job better and to make your job safer? Remember always, we tend to separate the two and it's either I work safe or I work productive. Almost every study that's ever been done on it, the safer you are, the more productive you're gonna be. The safer and the more productive you are, the better quality of product that you're going to deliver. In doing that, customer satisfaction goes up. If I'm making pe people feel safe and they are safe, I'm also increasing their job satisfaction. And I'm probably increasing morale. And in that, I might even go as far as to decrease my turnover rates. And that's a huge issue for a lot of organizations right now is how do we attract and retain new talent? And very rarely when you're talking to folks is part of the solution to that improve safety. But if you think about C5 leadership, a concept that we talk about a lot, competence, commitment, caring, courage, credibility, the middle word there that all that revolves around, caring. And we define that as preventing harm, but our definition shouldn't be limited to that, encouraging growth. And if we're encouraging growth and providing people professional development opportunities, I think that you will see their job satisfaction increase a lot. So 
as crazy as it sounds, and you've probably never thought of it that way, if you're challenged with recruiting and retaining qualified employees, part of the solution to that is safety and culture and how those things go hand in hand. So understand, understand yourself first and then others. And I, you know, I can't help but things like in almost any leadership training program that you go through, a lot of them have you take things like, let's say a disc assessment or a Myers-Briggs, some kind of personality profile. Why do they do that? The, the whole entire goal of a disc assessment, for instance, maybe not the whole entire goal, but certainly one of the main goals of taking that is exactly what Captain Ibersoft says. You've got to understand yourself first and then understand others and be able to adapt to others. So understand yourself first and then others understand expectations and that's a that's a question that i get asked a lot is okay almost every leadership training that i've ever been to teaches me how to lead others and to a certain extent it may even give me some insight into how to lead or interact with my peers but how do i lead up the organizational change how do i become my boss's boss if you will pretty simple if you think about it like Captain Abershoff does. In effect, and, and the ship, so the background of this book, if you haven't read it, is the Benfold was a ship that was, by a lot of rankings, one of, if not the worst ships in the Navy. Captain Abershoff takes it over, and in a very short time period during his command, it becomes one of, if not the best ships in the Navy. We'll come back to that thought in a minute because he clearly communicated that goal constantly. And I, I think that's important. But so the background you needed to know to understand this statement. In effect, I put myself in the shoes of my boss. And then what did he do? He needed to understand what his boss wanted from him and what his boss wanted from his ship. In effect, I put myself in the shoes of my boss, then asked, what do I want from Abishaw and Benfold? He then explains that if he could figure those things out and if he could do it, his bosses would leave him alone and focus on other ships that won't, weren't delivering so well. So if you're getting micromanaged and you don't like being micromanaged, here lies part of your solution to that. If you constantly find yourself micromanaging others, here lies part of the solution to that is Maybe you have to be a little more willing to delegate, listen aggressively, some of the things that we've mentioned, and you won't have to micromanage so much. But I think that's really important for us as safety leaders to really ask that question. What is it that my bosses expect from me? What is it that my team expects from me? What is it that the significant others, the friends and family of everybody on my team expects from me? And decidedly, that is for every member of your team to go home safely every single day, for sure. So understand expectations. If you're in any kind of a leadership or a safety role, they didn't just put a bunch of names in a hat and pull yours out and say, let's put them in this position. They put you there for a reason. They are trusting you to do certain things. And if you understand what those things are, and if you deliver those things, you'll probably gain a lot more freedom and independence and not get micromanaged so much. So really important to understand expectations of your team and expectations from your team in being an effective safety leader. And so we've taught when we teach leadership styles, we, we say that your leadership style should always be based on the people involved, the task that's being performed and the environment that you're in. And in his book, Captain Abershoff backs this up well and says, you know, I need to understand myself first. I need to understand others. I need to understand expectations. I also need to understand situations and decisions. What situation am I in? It's almost like a gap analysis, right? Where are we now? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? So, his situation was worst ship in the Navy, wanted to be the best ship in the Navy. How do we get there? Constantly communicated that goal 
of being the best ship in the Navy. And that's important in terms of leadership. And think about safety. What goals do we give people in terms of safety? Do we say, you know, we want to reduce our recordable rate by 15% next year, whatever the number is. Whether you realize it or not, what you're telling people, if you're sending goals like that, is it's okay if we have 10 injuries next year, if that's what translates the math into reducing our recordable rate by 15%. Or the flip side of that, and you got to be careful with this, our goal is for no one ever to make a mistake again, and you always got to be perfect. What happens when we set unreasonable or um, unachievable goals? So you have to be very careful with your safety messaging, but constantly communicate the goal. Be the best. And then you seek to achieve that goal by understanding, there's that word again, challenges, and seeking input from the crew, aggressive listening. And then as a leader, we also need to understand the impact of your decisions. And this is especially true the higher up the org chart you go. And as I explain that to people, one of the things I say, probably for most of us, 10 or 15 times a day in your email, you'll get an email that starts with FYI, right? So think about that. You get an email from me today that says FYI. You may delete it, not even read it. Or you may read it and be like, okay, that was cool. And then you're not gonna do anything with it. You get an email from your boss that says, FYI, I guarantee you're at least going to read it and you're probably at least somehow going to follow up with it. But now let's say 15 minutes from now, you get an email from your boss's boss's boss, the CEO of your organization or the owner of your organization. And it starts with FYI. At that point in time, FYI is not for your information. You perceive that to mean this is from the person, I've got to do something with this and it becomes a command. So you have to understand the impact of your decisions in terms of that. You also have to understand the impact of your decisions in terms of the example that you set. If you decide it's okay for you not to wear PPE, it's okay for you because it's only gonna take a second. I saw this happen one time, a VP with I think really, really good intentions of relatability and some other things jumped in a trench to help some folks work. The problem was it was an unprotected trench that was more than five feet deep. What was the impact of that decision? Do you think that that group of people looked at him and said, oh, you know what? More relatable, one of us willing to do the work. It's hot outside. He's sweating with us. I respect him more. Do you think they looked and said, I just saw him do an unsafe act. It's now okay for me to do that same unsafe act. And on top of that, if he's going to make judgments about what rules he's going to follow while he's out here, certainly it's okay for us to make judgments about what kind of rules we're going to follow. So remember the example that you set and set a good example. Be the person on that job site in that situation that says, hey, how deep is this trench? What are the rules about? What are, what are our standards? Why are those standards there? What do we need to do right now? Set that example. Back to micromanaging. Another thing is understand in terms of decision-making, there is no one person. I don't care what kind of positional authority you have that I guess in fairness, you could try to make all the decisions. That's probably not going to work out real well. So none. maybe a good way of phrasing it is no one person should make all the decisions. There's an art of safety leadership. And part of that art is understanding when to make decisions for your team, when to make decisions with your team, and when to let your team make their own decisions. And this is really important for us. And it ties back into the example we set. Focus more on results than salutes. In other words, I like to say, you know, in terms of a sports analogy, the coach should always be the one that loses and the team should always be the one that wins. Now there's caveats to that, but uh, I hope you understand where I'm going with that. And I do think it's important as we talk about safety specifically to mention when we say results, you can't focus on results alone. 
And I love in the world of human performance, how they define performance equals behavior plus results. You can't just look at a result and not understand the behavior driving it and then provide consequences, good, bad, right, wrong. So always understand why you're getting the results, why something ha is happening before you provide any feedback or consequences. And then in a safe environment, and this is so important and something that I think we just miss so much, yourself and your team, take calculated risk with the freedom to fail in a safe environment. Now there's times we can't fail. Failures that cause people to get hurt can't happen. Things that you're operationally expected to understand expectations, whatever the expectations are, whatever goals you have to meet, meet those goals. And back to understanding expectations, part of that is understand that if you are consistently or your team is not consistently meeting goals and standards, somehow or another, somebody's going to fix that. If you can identify that, and fix it yourself, that's good. If somebody has to fix it for you, that's probably not gonna go so well. But a lot of times what I see is, I'm in a leadership position and therefore my perception is I can't let my team fail ever. We can never have a bad idea. We can ne never offer a during brainstorming or work planning or whatever it may be. I, I can't, nobody should ever say anything stupid. And again, that leads to fear, which leads to inaction. So give your team in a safe environment, take calculated risk with the freedom to fail. So we've talked about now understanding ourselves first and then others, understanding expectations, understanding situations and decisions, a lot of understanding. And again, that, that, uh, that almost one sentence summary, leadership, understanding people. And I think as, as we go through these whole series of books, and you could throw in probably 400 other books, it, it's really, that's one of the things that I, I look for when I read a book is, what does it say that all the other books say? And by that, I mean, if you, I always kind of hate to throw this up, uh, put my book beside all these others, because they all have a label somewhere on them that says, number one bestseller. You notice the cover of my book's fairly blank. Uh, it doesn't say that. But look at any best-selling book. And if it's on leadership, in some form or fashion, one of the main points is going to be establish trust and credibility. Absolutely. And It's Your Ship is no different than that. It says that. One of the main points of the book is going to be you have to care about other people. And they usually differentiate between liking and care and define caring as some combination of preventing harm and encouraging growth. Caring is a lot more about mutual respect and appreciation than it is about whether or not we like each other. Hopefully, hopefully we can like each other, but we don't necessarily have to. They'll talk about the need to communicate as Captain Abershoff does a fantastic job of, both in terms of how and what we communicate, but also listen aggressively. That whole communication cycle that includes feedback from other people. And so I really challenge you as you think about what we've discussed today in your future learning and personal and professional development, anytime you're exposed to new material, or anytime you're going back and looking through old material or training or, or something that you've seen before, think about, you know, how does this relate to what I already know? How can it increase my knowledge and understanding? And, you know, they, they're all written from different perspectives. And in a lot of ways, they, they have a lot of the same principles. Some of them uh, present new ideas. But really, when you think about two words, when you think about safety, and you think about leadership, safety in particular, we will continue coming up with new technologies and better tools and better equipment. And, you know, the crane has the overload sensor on it kind of thing that will improve safety. But from the fundamental standpoints of it, as far as hazard identification and control, identifying and reducing risk and identifying and reducing or eliminating hazards, 
and then multiple layers of protection, defense in depth, uh, safety by design, those kind of concepts aren't going to change. They're, that's why they're such fundamental principles. And, and there's fundamental principles of, of leadership that I really think we need to understand. And this book, It's Your Ship. I mean, there's 50 or 75 of those principles in there. But our takeaway for today is understanding. And again, understanding yourself first and then others, understanding what others expect from you and your team, understanding situations, understanding impacts of decision. And again, that powerful statement, understanding the more control you give up, the more command that you get. So I'll take a second, man. Um, I've done a lot of talking and Questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, I believe I've got it set up right now where you can't unmute yourself. I'm going to fix that. Uh, so either in the chat window, in, in unmute yourself, talk out loud amongst yourselves, however you want to do it. But questions, comments, or thoughts about what we've talked about so far. This is a really, really bad time, 30 minutes into uh, our discussion here, but can everybody see me and hear me and see my screen right now? That would have been a good question to ask 30 minutes ago. Communication should always be timely while we're talking about time. Good, good, good. Oh, that's a great question. I love it. Thank you for asking that. What would be an effective metric to gauge if you've given up too much control? What about because it's a balancing act, right? So in leadership styles, on one extreme, you would have the autocratic leader, the micromanager that tells their team exactly what to do, exactly how to do it, and gives them no freedom of thought. On the opposite end of that spectrum is a laissez-faire kind of leader, passive. This just literally lets the team do whatever they want kind of thing. That's probably a bad way of phrasing that. But so a micromanager versus a let the team do it whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. How do you gauge what's appropriate? Uh, I guess one metric, and I would invite everybody to answer this because I don't know that I have a real firm answer to it, but one metric there would be the results and the performance of your team, right? So um, I thought I did allow participants to unmute themselves now you can unmute yourself thank you um but back to what i was saying so how do you gauge that and another book that i haven't focused on yet in this series but one of my favorite books is called the measure of a leader by aubrey and james daniels and essentially what they say in there is the measure of a leader ultimately is the performance of the team so it's a balancing act and and i don't think there's a clear-cut answer to that because and that's why I like the term the art of safety and the art of leadership. There's never going to be a roadmap that says, okay, David, you're in this situation doing this task with these people. Here's exactly how you should lead them. And it's going to work 100% of the time. You'll never get there. But what you can do is think about developing relationships. First of all, you have to know your team. You have to understand your team in order to be able to do this. But what do I think would probably work best for this individual or this group of people doing this task in this environment. And so on the one, one extreme would be, if you were on vacation tomorrow, would you be comfortable, comfortable cutting your phone off? That's a great question to ask yourself. I'll say it again. If you were on vacation tomorrow, would you be comfortable cutting your phone off? If the answer to that is no, you're probably a little too much command and control. If you could cut your phone off for the next three weeks <laughs> and not worry at all about your team, you're probably a little too much uh, laissez-faire. And, ooh, what a great answer. I'd say control should be inversely proportional to influence. I agree with that. And also, you know, a lot of this is how much do you trust your team and how experienced are they is also an indicator of that. So, um, and I'll go back to one more answer and then I'll, I'll let the group answer it as well to this question. An effective metric, uh, I think is uh, Captain Abershaw somewhat answers your question when he says this, 
constantly ask everyone for ideas about how to do their jobs better and listen aggressively. Ask your team. Uh, from the group, though, same question to the group. I love questions like that. That's such a good question. And, and while everybody else is thinking about that, I'll throw out one more thought. Um, and it was up on the screen somewhere. A calculated risk with the freedom to fail. So decide right now, where can my team not fail? And then maybe that's where you need a little more command and control. That obviously depends on who you're leading and how experienced they are. But then think about some things that won't kill somebody or blow something up. Let's just put it that way. And give it to your team and see what happens. You may be very pleasantly surprised with the results you get from that and or you may learn and identify some huge training opportunities. A job briefing, something as simple as a job briefing, right? Now, I don't want to devalue job briefings. But are you the one that always has to leave the job briefing and say all the words? Or are you comfortable delegating that task to someone else? Start picking things like that. Rotate responsibilities around for very important things like that. And I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. So I don't know that in, in, in a concrete answer to the question of what is a metric, I don't know one off the top of my head. But I, I hope that some of this discussion has given you some insight into how to gauge where you are in that balancing act. I mentioned, um, and this is something that, that I've always been, I feel like I don't know enough about it. I don't know how to say that, but how do you lead up the organization? I'm not seeking to provide any insight or wisdom about this. I'm seeking to gain insight from you right now. Um, how do you lead up? What are some effective strategies for leading up the organizational change? Because when you teach safety, and I teach a lot of safety classes, Almost inevitably in every discussion, it's going to come up. I get it. My team gets it, but the organization doesn't get it. Now, whether or not that's true, I don't want to go there. But one of the things that you need to be able to do is provide people thoughts on how to lead up. And I know how I usually answer those things, but I'd love right now for with the group we've got, how do you do that? How do you influence your bosses? How do you influence organizational change? How do you lead up? Somebody right now has to take a calculated risk with the freedom to fail. Uh, matter of fact, watch what I'm going to do. Uh, 